Hello, friends. Patrick McFarlane here with the Liberty Weekly Podcast coming at you with another episode. Uh, This is episode 59, and it's actually a reshoot of an earlier episode that we did that had some technical difficulties. And uh, we're going to try and emulate that great conversation here. But joining me on on the horn right now is Stephen Clyde, who just started a great podcast called the Peace and Liberty Podcast. He is the newest addition to the Libertarian Union, and we're very excited to have him. Stephen, how's it going, man? Hey, thanks for having me on again, Patrick. Glad we could redo this without me sounding like a robot. So uh, no one go back and listen to that old one. That one is, that one is uh, trash now. This is the, this is the episode now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a great, it was a great episode. And you oh, should- agreed, but yeah. I'm going to keep it because it was a great one, but there's still those technical difficulties, but that's just part of starting your own show. So we were talking about that and you've, you've been live for about a week now with this new show. Yep. So uh, my plan was to go Monday through Friday. And honestly, that's, I I don't know why I put that upon myself. Like I could have easily made it like a Tuesday, Thursday, made my life a lot easier, but I did it. I I've done five episodes so far. Um, Next week, I'm going to be doing a, a theme which is going to be limit a uh, woman in libertarianism. So I'm going to have five great guests on. Um, do you know uh, Dr. Mary Rewart? Yeah, I heard her on the Tom Woods show once. Actually, oh, she's she's wonderful. She has yeah. the book Healing Our World. Uh, excuse, excuse me, Healing Our World, and uh, she's coming out with another book called Death by Regulation. I mean, that title alone like makes you makes me want to pick it up. But um, she sent me a sneak peek of it, and I've just been looking through it, and it's really really great. So I'm going to go ahead and pre order her book. Um, but yeah, on the show, that she's going to be airing next Friday. So um, I'm going to be promoting her book and uh, that should be a really, really great episode. But, you know, the point I'm trying to break, th- I'm trying to break through the stereotype that libertarianism is like a white male movement. And even, even if statistically that was true, like the way I think about it, liberty is for absolutely everybody or at least everybody that respects property rights or, you know, cares about other people in, in a negative right sense. So, I mean, I don't care if you're black or blue or a woman or a trans like I, I just care if you care about liberty so trying to break through some stereotypes um it's gonna be a lot of fun so i had so many new things coming up that we'll talk about eventually yeah right i mean right on man and you're you're having sherry voluntary on is that correct yep we actually already recorded the episode and, and, it, went, and it went great she's a really awesome friend and uh yeah so i think she's gonna be airing oh i believe it's gonna be wednesday so uh, we'll link to that yeah yeah, right on. No, I w- I've been meaning to try and connect with her actually, but uh, oh, she's well, awesome. She's awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, because I see uh, speaking freely her radio show on Facebook all the time in the groups and stuff. So, it, we have we have a thing going, I think, in these groups. Maybe it's maybe it's just us spamming our content at it. But <laughs> oh no, I was talking to Dan the other day about how much I love the Libertarian Union because you have like five, ten other friends that are just sharing your stuff and like we all like promote each other. And it's a big domino effect. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's been uh, super cathartic, actually. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. So why don't, why don't you talk a little bit about the impetus behind the show? Talk about your liberty journey, maybe your liberty journey first, and then how it uh, went into your show. Yeah, so um, I kind of had the typical Repu- um, Republican upbringing. I was born and raised the Baptist parents, uh, I went to a private school when I was younger and they were heavily, they're heavily neoconservative. So I grew up in that type of environment and growing up in that type of environment, I have similar views that uh, compared to what I do now, but obviously libertarianism, I've evolved a lot more in my views, but I used to um, be sound in economics, but I just thought war was a good thing, you know, essentially. And I thought government was good in some areas. So um, when I entered college, when I was 18, I, uh, my first two semesters, I took an English and sociology class, and man, that class screwed those classes screwed me up because um, the way left wing people talk to you, there is some type of emotional aspect to it that when you say something emotionally, it seems like it's true because like oh man, like I'm, you're just like feeling what that person's saying, but in reality, I was getting brainwashed with a whole lot of stuff that I didn't realize till later, and it's often way way later you realize like man like. I can't believe she was saying that stuff to me. But um, I, my second semester of college, I took an economics class and that completely changed my life. I had a great teacher. Um, I remember there was this girl that sat in front of me and I would talk to her throughout the semester. I was at a point where I think it was during the Obama election and I didn't have a problem saying I'd vote for Obama. I would just, uh, I was leaning, I was headed toward the left you know, coming from my neoconservative background. And uh, I remember she asked the teacher, um, why can't we just print more money? Won't that help people? 
And he gave the lesson of scarcity and it's like money has value because it's scarce. And something went off in my head that I, yeah, I, ma I made a connection for the first time and that I realized what economics was. And basically economics explains almost everything that your natural intuitions can't teaches us how people interact with, with each other. So that was my journey to libertarianism. It's, um, yeah, I found Ron Paul, I think it was in 2008. So pretty typical in that way. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how I found libertarianism. Um, as far as the show, um, I, I tell a lot of people this, I could have never, ever imagined I would be doing this. I remember one day I was just sitting at home, you know, thinking about things and I, I put myself in front of a camera and I was just like, if I was going to do a podcast, how would it sound? And I just winged like an intro and I'm like, huh. And I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it. And Eventually, I bought a decent camera and put myself in front of that, and things just progressed. And eventually, I just got an idea stuck in my head. <clears throat> it's funny if you ask Dan, I don't know if he still has this, but I would be sending him little drawings I would make on paint. And I was like trying to think of like a studio, and like this is pretty much how it looked in the paint picture. Like, this is how I imagine it. So, um, the reason I wanted to do the show is because I, well, one, I want to bring more people to the idea of liberty. Like if they stumble across my video, maybe they'll hear something I say that resonates somehow and they think about it more. But I think there's a big problem in the libertarian movement. And I'm sure you realize it too, that people aren't reading books. And if you're not reading books, what the hell are you doing? Are you, are you watching a YouTube video and using a talking point from that? You're going to get easily defeated in any argument with a leftist that read, reads books. And a leftist could be reading BS books, but they're going to have B they're going to have some type of knowledge on hand, whether it's BS or not, and you're not going to have anything. And this is way, way, way too common among libertarians. I do not understand it. Like when I found libertarianism, I admit I was kind of a talking point libertarian for many years, but you get to a point where you realize, man, I don't change anyone's views when I talk to them. And I remember when I first started reading like Henry Hazlitt and I picked up a uh, Rothbard, when I was talking to people, it was starting to become much different. It was becoming apparent to me that even if people wouldn't admit that I changed their mind, they would come to me like a week later and be like, damn, like you were just throwing out fact after fact after fact. And I went home that night and looked it up and you were right. Well, how about that? You know, you pique people's interest by first finding some common ground. You know, if, if I start with the leftists, I'm just like, man, I freaking hate the war. Um, you know, all these war criminals, you, you, you can talk, bring it about any way you want. But once you establish that common ground, that's where you go in. And, you know, you can take it from any angle you want to. You can start with crony capitalism, just be like, man, I, I hate the fact that Walmart gets these billions of subsidies, you know, because libertarians do agree with that. I mean, we, they shouldn't get any, any subsidies at all. Um, so you can find, uh, you're trying to build the bridge and I try, I basically trying to build the bridge from libertarians who they have a few talking points. Maybe they could explain why the minimum wage is bad decently, but overall, like I'm trying to build the bridge to help people realize, just go pick up a book. You know, if you read economics in one lesson, you're going to understand more economics than most people get an economics degree. It's the truth. And I was reading Henry Hazlitt the other day, like he conveys these ideas beautifully. So that's the gist of why I started my podcast. Like I just, I want libertarianism to grow and I think it's dying. I think with Sarwark and Gary Bake the Cake Johnson and Bill, uh, I'm going to support Hillary instead of my own running mate, John, um, Weld. You can't make this stuff up. So I, I, I would like to see libertarianism go in a different direction. I think the one thing I'm cautious about is, you know, I am starting a podcast. I could become, you know, quite famous or a celebritarian or whatever you want to call it. But I always want to let people know that I'm never seeking to try to control anything or make you think about things. I'm just trying to op ex open your our mind to ideas. And then from there, maybe you can go out and make a change. But I stress that I never want to become president. I, you know, I can I can respect what Adam Kokesh is doing with uh, Adam Kokesh for not president. I mean, if I was going to do it, that's the only way I would do it. And just, and just be honest, like I'm never, ever, ever going to vote for a tax increase. F off with that. The only thing I'm ever going to do as a politician is deregulate. I will, I will only deregulate and take away laws. I'll never add to laws. And that's why Ron Paul, you know, people, you could say, I hate all politicians. So wasn't Ron Paul even bad? Well, no. I mean, Ron Paul never voted for a tax increase. Can't you respect them for that? I mean, uh, you can't say that from any other people. And, uh, yeah, so I've been talking for a minute, but that's kind of the gist of where I'm at. I just, uh, 
I want this thing to grow because Liberty is such a beautiful idea. It has a mountain of evidence behind it and it's a very, very sound ideology. Well, yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I'm really encouraged. I think just by what I've kind of have in my mind to be this network of, uh, I guess, podcasters or voices or people on the internet that are connecting together. And this idea that I had in one of my episodes, episode 57, I gave a talk at a Agora Symposium about the American Revolution and how we had uh, a lot of literate people in the colonies and a lot of people were writing in pamphlets and talking to each other. And there was a national discussion happening. And I guess if I could do anything, I wanted to emulate that idea and show how we can do that in the modern day using counter economics to fund hobbyist operations or professional operations like this, like independent media. And, you know, if, if we can get what I guess Prof. CJ would call a network of guerrilla scholar warriors, right? maybe we can have this organic conversation that is bottom up kind of thing. I mean, it's like, why do you think people love Tom Wood so much? He went to Harvard and Columbia. He's just a really, really family oriented guy, really, really classy guy. People love that. And, and it's kind of a, a breath of fresh air, really, because I think the caricature of libertarians is that, you know, we smoke pot and, you know, we just we just really want freedom to like do drugs or, you know, you could uh, stereotype it any way you want to. Or libertarians uh, are selfish and want the poor to die. That's a common one. I mean, you hear all these different things. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just trying to break through some of these stereotypes. Um, one thing I like about uh, Dr. Rewart's uh, book is um, she talks about compassion and how the reason she came to libertarianism was realizing that um, true compassion is when you take something out of your pocket and give it to somebody. Compassion is not when you take it out of somebody's pocket and give it to somebody else. It doesn't matter if you believe that the person you're taking it from doesn't need it. It does not matter. That's not the point. That's not true compassion. And I think we need to encourage people to think about it in that way that I think some, I think some libertarians are keen to like run with it and like, yeah, like I'm, I'm selfish. Like I should be able to do that. But I think most libertarians in general, like are charitable and are caring. It's just I mean, our, our ideology just says that we don't want to use violence against people to get our way. Why, why, what, what does that have to do with compassion? That's like a separate topic, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, that's kind of what I've been getting at too, is trying to put, you know, not just be a, a preacher or anything, but try and be the change and lead by example, I guess. And Exa exactly. And like, it's like, you don't want to sound cliche, like be the change you want to see in the world. It, it has more meaning to it than you think, because um, people are looking for the right ideas. People are looking for a path. And I, I think the people that are easiest to work with are those that are right on the edge. You know, I meet people that they, sometimes they call themselves apolitical. They don't really think about it much, but you know, they kind of have some features of both. And it's just, you present those people with a few facts because they're listening. People who are extremists on either sides tend to not listen, but people in the middle are listening and you push them the right direction. And wow, you can create another, another libertarian. And I'll be honest, I've, I've converted a lot of people to libertarianism, but you know, even if it's just one person I converted, that feels amazing. But, uh, having the potential to be able to possibly change hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives. That is something to look forward to and wake up to each day. I would say. Well, and we live in a day and age where that's possible, you know, I mean, we're absolutely. Yeah. You're down in Colorado and I'm in the twin cities here and we're talking in real time and people can tune in and, you know, hear what we have to say. That's just, I mean, I can make the analogy to the Gutenberg printing press that's been made over and over again, but, uh, you know yeah, I mean? you know, I was listening to, to Thomas soul one time and he was talking about, I forget the the period, but I think he was just saying like, you know, within a few hundred years ago, most people had not traveled within 50 miles of where they were born in their entire lives. Wow. Think, but think about how much, how, think about this is a completely different world we live in where, yeah, in a matter of seconds, I could be like, hey, Patrick, uh, you're in central time zone. I'm in mountain time zone. Let me call you in about three seconds and call shows up in three seconds. It's fascinating. Uh, we take a lot for granted. We take a whole lot for granted and absolutely you're right that we have so many, op this is the time of opportunity right now. The day of the internet, the day of mass technology that we can just get around and do things so much easier. It's crazy. Um, we're so privileged that we take it for granted. Uh, it's kind of an odd story and I was just thinking about it, but 
I get friend, friend requests from people from other countries and I add them and this guy was messaging me last night and it's hard to tell if people are real or not, but he was saying like, yeah, like I live in, uh, I live in West Africa and I was, I was trying to ask this guy, like, you know, can you tell me about your government? Is it an impressive government? And I don't know if I'm talking to a real burn or not, but I'll take that chance. And they messaged me back like, yeah, my, I'm sitting here, my family's suffering. Like, um, we haven't eaten in days. And he was like, can you please send me some money to help me? And I, I didn't respond back. I didn't know what to say. That's horrible. But you don't know if it's if real or fake, but it's, there are people suffering like that in the world. When you talk about starvation in the U S well, psh, what are you talking about? I mean, people starve for a few hours till someone gives them money. I mean, people, I mean, if you look at the homeless people in Denver, just in particular, they're pretty well fed. I'm not saying they're doing well. Their lives are completely broken. They're homeless, but they get fed. They get a few, they get a few dollars. I mean, I, go, go sit at one stoplight and look at a homeless person there. You can count. And usually in one, one stoplight, uh, routine, you can see a few people give them money. It adds up. So, yeah. I mean, we take so much for granted. It's like in India, there's like generations of homeless people. When you ask these people, where do you live? Well, I live right here, the ground underneath my feet. Like, that doesn't even make that. Th we wouldn't even be able to comprehend that most people. Well, and I, <clears throat> I think of, uh, you know, Yemen too, and people, starving and dying because of our foreign policy and Libya and the slave trade that's restarted. But it's funny you oh. mentioned that because I had a, I had a conversation with someone on Twitter where I made a tweet about Yemen and he's, he kind of got after me, but he's like, no, my, I live in the UK and my sister lives in South Yemen right now. And he, I, I was tweeting against the U S involvement and against Saudi Arabia, but he was saying, you know, the South, the South Yemeni people want Saudi Arabia to come in because you know, they're being oppressed too in, in their own certain way. And it's just, you want no NAP violations. But he was telling yeah. me all these things that I just, that I didn't know about. And this is the day and age when we can, you know, have a direct conversation with someone that is directly, you know, afflicted by these situations. And Oh, I feel, I've been meeting people yeah. from all over the world. Like um, this one guy added me the other day from South Africa. And if you don't know what's going on in South Africa, just go Google it. Just go Google it. I mean, a, a lot's happening right now. Um, a lot of it is the result of apartheid, which is from many years ago. And that was a crazy, that, that's a whole other discussion. But, um, you know, a lot of places around the world are in turmoil, just complete turmoil. Venezuela, the people are starving. Uh, I think in 21 out of 54 countries in Africa, they're ruled by oppressive dictators. 21 out of 54. It's like, can't even imagine. Yeah. I, I was talking to Anthony Samroff the other day and if you've never spoken to him, get him on your show because he's the most uplifting guy. And he talks about something that's so true. I mean, obviously we would, you know, we're anarchists. We want to get all government out of our lives completely, but we also have to make use of the Liberty we do have. I can, I can go out right now, go out right now. I can make a podcast with you. Um, I can be pretty certain that, you know, my property is pretty protected, even though it's not a perfect, climate you know i could theoretically call somebody so I, I there are things to appreciate i think some libertarians could go down that dark hole where it's like you're constantly pessimistic i think optimism is a much better way to bring people on board it's like what do you hate the most about republicans and democrats well they fear monger that's that's at least what i hate the most they fear monger about everything everything and libertarians can be that that third voice that is like hey it doesn't have to be like this. Look, there's only two ways in which me and you can interact voluntarily or coercively. We can all choose the first one and things will work out great. But if we choose a second one, well, we're just repeating history. And people talk so much about, oh, we, we learn history so we don't repeat it. Well, how many people really learn history? Yeah, right. <laughs> how many <laughs> learn the right version of history? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, exactly. If, if they if they learn history at all, they're learning the wrong history or they're learning history with omissions, you know, history written by the victors. But oh, yeah, exactly. I think it is, it is easy to be negative and I I can be pretty damn negative at times. But oh, I, I'm out of coffee right now. I um I had Starbucks earlier, so I'm good now. But this morning, I you wouldn't want to catch me on Facebook. I was <laughs> right. I, no, I, I definitely get like that, too. But I try to keep positive in that. I get messages from people almost every day now, whether it's like a thank you for what you're doing or, um, Hey, like th thanks for adding me as a friend or, um, Hey, can you 
give me a resource to what you were talking about. Just every single day I get messages and I know for a fact I'm making a difference, even though I just started. So, and you are too, and so is Dan, and so is everyone else. Like we are reaching people. Um, now there's another podcast out right now. Do you know Anarcho Christian? I think it's called. Yeah, I had him. I had uh, Stephen on the show. Yeah, I've been talking to that guy. I want to get him on eventually, but is he in the Libertarian Union? I, I forget. Um, I don't know. He's he's with uh with uh, Roger Paxton over there, but um he's a smart guy. I mean, that's no, I. I love the diversity because I'm privately Christian. I don't talk about it much. I mean, it's just religion's a different subject than politics for me. Like I, you know, if someone wants to go there, it's like, all right, but well, we're getting away from politics. But yeah, I mean, I, I love the concept of the show. And just the point is that I see a lot of uh, new things coming out. Like, uh, do, you, do you know Ben Swan? Uh, yeah, I've heard of Ben Swan. Love, what? Ben, love ben Swan. Um, he, he is part of, um, oh, what is it called? Truth and Media. That's what he's called. It's called, it's called Truth and Media. And he does a Tuesday, Thursday little show. And it's amazing because he did it right. Honestly, and if you look at my podcast, like I really, really try not to go above 25 minutes. Once people look at a video and they're like, oh man, 45 minutes, two hours, like that's a commitment. Mm -hmm. 20, 20 minutes is like, I could listen to that on the way to work. You know what I mean? So the way he does it, he does like six to eight minute videos, just packed full of info, really, really nice looking studio. That's the way to do it because um, Dan was having this problem. Like Dan would put out like one to three hour episode and like nobody watches them. And it's not just him, it's everybody. Like the three hour commitment, like unless it's Rogan, maybe some people will commit to Rogan, but most people don't have one to three hours to dedicate to a video. They just don't. So I, I, I've been trying to go for a little bit shorter, you know, pack a lot of info in there in like a short amount of time. But um, yeah, that, that's at least my theory right now. But um, Dan, obviously, he, he's doing the last nighters now. So that was that was his goal is to, you know, cut back. And obviously, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, it was I one thing I w wanted to key into was uh, division of labor. You know, that that's I think one thing that we should talk about as well, because like you were like you were saying, there's so many people producing content right now. Well, we have all these niches that need to be filled in the movement. And, you know, as capitalists, we know that in order to be the most efficient, we have to have that division of labor. And right, exactly. I mean, what I'm trying to do is to be the libertarian legal guy, because I think there's a gap there, you know, and I, I, I hate to peg people. I hesitate to, you know, try and say this is what they are. But as I see it, you know, Lark, Larkin Rose would be the talking to status guy and Adam Kokesh is the speaking with vets guy. And so we have all those different positions, but it, it's hard to find that niche. And I think it takes a lot of trial and error. And I think that's the hardest part because it, it takes a lot of hard work and time and, uh, you know, trying things and having them fail. <laughs> so, so that's been some things that I've been dealing with lately. Yeah, no, I've, I've, dealt with all those struggles and people watching they're like what the hell is going on <laughs> you know, I, i'm dealing with my own issues trying to like perfect things it takes a long long time um i i was telling dan i think it was like two or three weeks ago i was just about to start and i was sitting there with like some like resentment like man like i don't have enough money to get my website set up i um i don't know if my editing is going to look good enough because if you look at my videos there are plenty of mistakes plenty i mean that'll all perfect over time but um I've had a lot of pitfalls. It really, it really breaks you down. It really makes you think like, man, like, was I meant to do this? Uh, you constantly have those thoughts. So it was hard doing this. Yeah, it was, it was, it was hard doing this. So I, I guess in that sense, I'm very, very proud of it. Yeah. Um, well, you should be. I, I mean, like, have, have you had it yet where you finish a video or you finish doing one and you're about to release it and you're like, man, that sucked. <laughs> well, um, the, the hardest ones for me are my solo episodes, because I'll tell you, I have a pronunciation problem. I've had it all my life and it's not for all words. Sometimes I can go like half an hour without mispronouncing something, but other times I talk too fast and just, man, I just flub words. I get really embarrassed about it. So when I do solo episodes, I might do a take like 15 times. Yeah. I, I've always been like that. I've always <laughs> been like that, but, um, I think just in practice, you get better. Um, John Stossel is one of my favorite and he talks about how he had a stutter and if you have a stutter that really messes up things. So you had to work on that. So if he can overcome that, I can, I can learn to slow down and learn to pronounce things a little bit better. You know, it, it comes in time. 
Well, I mean, I was I was gonna like finish and just say that you know you look back at at you look back at it afterwards, and I've been doing this for almost a year now, and I have a master episode list, and I look back and I'm like, man, that's a uh, sixty episodes. That's a, a body of work, you know. Oh, I know. I yeah, you're doing great, man. I'm like, I oh. I hope at this point I can get to like episode ten because you know hopefully at this point I got to record a bunch of episodes and. I record everything a week in a week in advance for a reason, because, for example, like the last two nights, my guest, um, they just had an issue and couldn't show up. So imagine I, I had to record episodes and put them out the same day. Oh, boy, that would that would uh, be a disaster instantly because you have a guest that can't show up. So I'm um, a lot of it's just luck. You get lucky that you make um, recording schedules with people and they show up. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not as easy as it looks. Um, there is a reason not a lot of people do this, and there's a reason a lot of people who do it fail or just no one watches their show because there's something missing. Yeah. And uh, I I constantly like I I'm OCD about going back over and like oh like I'll never could never gonna say uh, Joseph Pierre Proudhon gonna say Prudhon you know just like fixing those errors over right. time. Yeah. Yeah. So well. Um do what else should we do you have anything else that you wanted to plug do we want to put a bookend on this well um you guys are more than welcome to check out my website which i just did my blue host yesterday so you can check out for peace and liberty.com that's going to be my main website um pretty much everything else is just going to be slash the peace and liberty podcast now i'm trying to work on my youtube channel name like you need like 100 subscribers so for youtube just type in the peace and liberty podcast you'll find me I'm on CastBox now, which is a, an app you can download on your smartphone. That just has the audio only version, but it's pretty nifty. I, I actually really, really like uh, CastBox. Just download the app, type in my name, and you'll find my episodes. Um, you guys can, if you guys want to donate to me, because I need help right now, I'm not going to lie, but um, uh, you guys can find me on Patreon and GoFundMe, just all slash the Peace and Liberty podcast. Let's see what else did I want to link to. Well, I, I can throw out this other announcement that. Now that I have my Bluehost, I can have as many websites as I want to. So I'm going to be starting a website, hopefully in the next month. It, it might take me a while, but I'm going to start a website called Debate Liberty. And I'm going to be setting up some pretty professional looking debates in that I'm going to get two people who like really, really want to debate each other and actually go at it, you know, not just friends debating. And they'll have a few weeks to prepare. We'll promote it for a few weeks and hopefully get a, a live audience. And, uh, you know, I really hope that can take off. But that's kind of a thing where it either works or it doesn't. And, um, you know, it would, it would just be really fun. I, I love hosting debates with people because you get to hear, you get to see things through people's lenses and that's important. It's, it's easy to shut out everybody and just call them a communist, but like try to understand where they're coming from. Cause maybe you can find an opportunity to correct them. Cause maybe they, maybe they're thinking about things just a little bit wrong. You know, or I don't want to describe that, but yeah. No, right, right on. I think that's a great idea. And, um, you know, hopefully it'll become a facet in the future going forward of where people can come and have discussions. But yes, you were saying your website is for it's for peace and liberty as an F O R F O R. That's good. That's correct. I'm going to change my camera battery by the way, but yep. It's a uh, for peace and liberty.com kind of how you think of for new Liberty by Rothbard. Excellent. Yeah. So, well, I I'll close it up here towards the end uh, while you're fixing your camera, <laughs> but um, I, I just wanted to touch on this idea of encouraging people to have their own voice online, whether it's, uh, you know, you sitting up with the microphone and having a, a YouTube page where you could easily just throw your thoughts up there. And I think what I'm really seeing and what I really love about the Liberty Movement, the online sphere right now is that people are doing this. You know, you have Mance Raider who's come about in the last year. He has come out with a book. He has his own show. Um, you know, Steven is doing stuff. My buddy Thijs uh, from the Netherlands, whom we met on Facebook, and he was listening to the show, and now he wants to start a show uh, providing a libertarian legal uh, perspective from the European side. So that's cool. His show will be dropping like next week or in the next couple weeks here. So I'm I'm so stoked that you're starting your show. We need more people to do this, even though it is tough, but it is rewarding, and you meet great people, and you really grow as a person. So. Oh, I think that's that's the thing I've gotten most out of it is just that I've met so many people and libertarians are pretty up. Most of them are pretty awesome people in that they're very supportive. And, you know, we know we're a mi minority politically right now, but um, we reinforce each other because like we know 
I, I think it's great when I see other people that were red pilled per se, because just like, man, like I can remember my journey going through that. That's why I think when I first considered myself an anarcho capitalist, I would have been more prone to bash somebody and just be like, oh, you know, you, you believe in one function of government, your status, but I mean, you got to try to understand where people are coming from. What kind of environment did they grow up in? What did they hear? What was, what was put into their head 24 seven? You want to blame somebody, uh, who is gullible growing up uh, for getting brainwashed. I mean, I don't, I don't understand that. It's like you either want to help or you don't. If you, if you don't want to talk to people, like you're not undoing, you're just making it worse. When you argue with people, you know, you're just reinforcing what they think. Like, oh, libertarians are angry and crazy and call you status. Like, are you kidding me? Like libertarians, I could, t I could just talk for hours and hours and hours. And that's like the big difference I see is that, you know, when you talk to Republicans or Democrats, they typically have one-liner talking points and that's <clears throat> the one percent has more wealth than the bottom 99 percent i mean how many times have you freaking heard that on tv man it's like i can do the voice because i've heard it so much and uh it, when you talk to a libertarian you kind of realize that man the reason republicans and, and democrats and the two-party system can do what they do is because when you listen to the media everything's in like 30 second sound bits how do you categorize libertarianism in 30 seconds? Well, you got to understand some history. You got to actually talk about things. It takes time to talk about things and think about them. You can't do it in 10 seconds. I mean, it's just entering into, you know, you, when you enter into academia, that's what you're entering into. Yeah. And, um, well, I think though the, the, the biggest thing I think is from people who I think are asleep is the majority of the population. I think we could reach them, but at the same time, I think what I get from, you know, at least my wife who isn't interested in politics as much as I am is that she says, well, I'm, I'm just one person and I can't change anything. And, um, you know, it's so depressing and I have my own stuff going on. I'm trying to, you know, go to work every day and living paycheck to paycheck. So how do we reach those people and illustrate to them that A, they can make a difference and B, it's important that they do? Uh, I, I think the main way is just to make them realize um, once you have facts on command, and I use that phrase a lot because what I mean is, you know, I, I use the pun, I use a pun intended on my guns episode because I'm trying to arm you with knowledge. You know, you take this and you start talking to people. And when you have things on command to say, like, uh, you can bring up a date or you can bring up a person, people realize like, huh, he's not just repeating what I would expect him to repeat. He's talking about all these different things. Like, for example, I used to work with this one guy. And uh, he mentioned the robber barons one time. He was like, oh, you know, we need government regulations because you remember those robber barons. And I was like, well, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt had a pretty interesting story. In fact, uh, I think the New York Times called him the greatest anti-monopolist that ever lived because essentially what he would do is just under, uh, pr undercut people. You know, he would, um, well, we would, they would call that evil, but really it's just providing a cheaper service. He would uh, have, he was in the steam um, ship industry. And he would transport people back and forth and he would keep cutting his prices. And eventually he made the fee, uh, he, he, he cut the fee down completely. There was no fee to use the boat, but he would just charge people for food on the ship. And he just crushed everybody. And basically he talks, it talks about, um, and the book I'm referencing, by the way, it's called the myth of the robber barons by Burton Folsom. Great book. Um, the first chapter alone will just make you think like, huh, I can see why they're bashed, but at the same time, they were anti-monopolist in the sense that people who seek to provide the best product for the lowest price. I mean, look at what Rockefeller did. I mean, we could talk about things Rockefeller did that were shady, but he brought the price of oil down to an amount that made it so everybody could live. So how we do now. I was going to say the James J. Hill house is right down the street and he was the one that, you know, he had the first privately funded railroad that. Yes. Yes. Uh, he, he's a very, very interesting story. He's a, uh, I think he's chapter two or three in the book. So yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, um, so bringing things to a close here, uh, everybody definitely should jo uh, go check out Stephen's podcast at, uh, is that fourpeaceandliberty.com now? Is that where you're sending people? Well, I'm, that's that's my website that I just got set up. I would just suggest for now, um, if you just want to listen to audio only, download CastBox on your I, uh, iPhone or smartphone, and um, you can, use, you can uh, check me out audio that way. Uh, just go to YouTube though, and just check out the Peace and Liberty podcast. Find me there. But over in a week, I, I'll hopefully have my website set up. But you can go there. You can kind of see. You can watch me progress day by day. But I'll start plugging that website more. But 
it was it was really good timing because when we did this when we recorded last um i didn't have any of this set up so i i think it all worked out for the best man it's been really great talking to you Oh yeah, you as well, most definitely. And I'll include a link in the show notes page to, um, you know, whatever links you throw my way, but also to your YouTube channel as well. So, all right, right on. Well, thanks everyone. Um, uh, I forgot to mention that you can view the video podcast at my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. I'm directing people towards BitChute more so. So bitshoot.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. Uh, but also it will be embedded in the show notes page at libertyweekly.net forward slash 59. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. We'll catch you later.